Good evening, everyone, and welcome. My name is Molly Silberberg, and I organize BAM's Humanities Programming. Thank you all for joining us. I'm truly honored to be hosting tonight's program in partnership with Gray Wolf Press. Last February, we partnered with Gray Wolf to present Future Lit, an evening of readings and conversation with authors that are writing us into the future and broadening literary horizons. It's been a pleasure to think creatively with the wonderful folks at Gray Wolf about how we build community around literary programming. And I'm thrilled to be partnering with them for tonight's conversation with these two brilliant poets in the virtual space. A few logistical notes. If you are looking for captioning during the live stream of tonight's discussion, it is accessible via the stream text link, which is posted in the chat. Thank you to Lachey for making tonight's program more accessible. Please note that BAM will not accept any hateful language in the chat and BAM retains the right to determine what language is considered hateful and to delete comments or block users who do not follow these guidelines. Finally, for anyone looking to purchase copies of Beholding or The More Extravagant Feast, you can get a 15% discount off of your purchase of either book by using the code HEAL now through January 31st via Greenlight Bookstore. This info and the link is also posted in the chat. I'm going to turn things over in just a moment to my colleague Morgan LaRocca, Publicity Associate at Grey Wolf, who will share more of the, about the specifics of tonight's program. Before we begin, I want to acknowledge the land that I am on today and on which BAM's physical buildings are located, which is the unceded land of the Lenape people. As we engage today with Ross Gay and Leah Naomi Green's beautiful reflections on the natural world, I acknowledge indigenous stewardship of this land and honor the Lenape elders past and present, as well as future generations. Thank you all again for being with us tonight. And here's Morgan to bring us into this evening's program. Thank you so much, Molly, and everyone at BAM and Greenlight who worked so hard to make this event possible. It is so wonderful to continue to deepen our partnership as we work together to create spaces, even virtual ones, where we can collectively dream and imagine the future and hear from voices that are already working on constructing it for us. Before I introduce our incredible poets, I wanted to take a moment to say a bit about who Grey Wolf is and introduce tonight's program. Grey Wolf Press is a leading independent publisher committed to the discovery and energetic publication of 21st century American and international literature. We champion outstanding writers at all stages of their careers to ensure that adventurous readers can find underrepresented voices in a crowded marketplace. We believe works of literature nourish the reader's spirit and enrich the broader culture, and that they must be supported by attentive editing, compelling design, and creative promotion. None of our work would be possible without our amazing community of authors, donors, and each and every one of you. And I just wanna thank you so much for being here and for being a reader. I would also like to take a moment to acknowledge that Grey Wolf Press is located on Dakota land and pay tribute to the Dakota people especially as we enter into a conversation about our relationship to land, nature, and healing. Tonight, we'll be hearing from two incredible poets who each have one hand in the earth and the other on the pen. Both of their poetry centers around how our relationship with nature and one another deepens our understanding of grief, gratitude, and becoming. In this time when so much of our collective energy goes towards struggling and resisting oppressive social structures, and the pandemic creates more isolation from one another. The important work of these poets help us imagine what might exist beyond and apart from these very structures. With that framing in mind, I wanted to offer a question as a tether for the forthcoming conversation. A question that I hope you, the audience, will keep in mind through the readings and conversation and when we open up the floor to you for questions. The question is, what tools does our connection to nature and to one another give us to heal, transform, and reimagine the future as individuals and as a collective? Before I th turn things over to Ross and Leah, I have the honor of briefly introducing them. Ross Gay teaches poetry at Indiana University and is the author of several poetry collections, including Catalog of Unabashed Gratitude, the essay collection, The Book of Delights, 
and most recently the poem Beholding. He is a writer that in the words of my dear friend Sophie, who I was just talking to before this event, tends and holds his subject, himself and his reader in the most caring and gentle ways. Ross, thank you so much for joining us. Leah Naomi Green teaches English and environmental studies at Washington and Lee University. She came to Green Wolf through the Walt Whitman Award for her debut collection of poems, The More Extravagant Feast, which was selected by Lee, Lee Young Lee. It has been such an honor to work besides Leah and this powerful collection. Her work is a steadfast reminder that our very nature is to constantly be in the process of transformation. And through our own process of transforming, we are helping other living things become. So many thanks again to you both for being here. I'm gonna turn it over to Ross for his reading and then Leah will read and then they will be in conversation. Thank you, Morgan. Thank you, everyone. Leah, it's good to be with you. Um, I'm coming from Miami, I'm from uh, Bloomington, Indiana, which is uh, the traditional lands of the Miami and the Shawnee and the Potawatomi and the Delaware. Um, so I, um, yeah, so I just want to acknowledge that. And I am going to try to read a little bit from this book called Beholding, <laughs> which is a, it's a tricky book to read from because it's about a um, hundred pages. And so to excerpt a little bit is a little bit, um, it's just fun, it's just fun. It's sort of like a puzzle and you see what, how it goes. Um, but anyway, I'm gonna start, I'm just gonna read for about, hey, thank you, Leah. <laughs> I'm gonna read for about 10 minutes. And, um, but I wanna, I just wanna start with this photograph. Um, this is a photograph of my father. And you're goddamn right, I'm going to bring my father into this poem. That's just how it goes with me, crawling into it as he is not most prominently in my memory, in my body, though occasionally. For instance, crawling and in reaching in flight from his bed to the bathroom where the meds for his diverticulitis sat on the bed on the bathroom. I'm sorry, with it for his diverticulitis sat on the counter in a pain from the strawberries he couldn't resist. A cluster of sweetness beckoning then wrecking him. Please don't blame the strawberries. Never blame the strawberries. But he had to get to work. Something stupid that he hated to be clear. Though truth be told, it was a treat. The occasional family dinners at Burger King when he'd load us up, chicken sandwich, no mail for me, whopper with cheese for my brother, always the largest fries possible. Mom, some, something dietish. Oh, and sodas, sodas. Smuggling himself from behind the counter to sit a few minutes with us at our plastic booth, giddy in our cholesterol and ketchup. And so he was crawling toward the amber cylinder of relief, less poetically known as amoxicillin. And Lord, it is not devotion to work I am lauding, God forbid, nor the shitstorm of the nuclear family. I am simply looking at the reaching crawling sometimes is. In this instance, my father toward who he loved, which is a kind of flying my dad does sometimes in my body the trillion tiny splayed stars. My body is made of my father reaching to keep from falling. Do you know the mangrove? Do you know the mycelial ballet who were human long, long before we were and remained so long, long after reaching to keep from falling? And lonely for him, I sometimes will study my own hands, which are his hands recalling the way he held my brothers and my heads through the crosswalk, or how he would hold like a glass of Prosecco one of the lilies my mother planted, lowering his face to the flute and breathing and breathing and closing his eyes and resting. How badly I want my father to be resting and resting and smiling in the breathing and the breathing, and surface with his nose kissed with the gold kissing lilies do, 
or more ambitious, I look into the true impossibility of this body, this cargo, this loot, this star magnolia bloom just shoved itself from the velvet nipple of its bud, its womb, offering its fragrance into the world, the small grove inside my body, which is my father waving his flowers at me, reaching toward me to keep me from falling as he would down the shore, the crummy boardwalk at Seaside Heights blathering, the waft of fried everything and carnival jangles beyond. And my dad, younger than me now, not far from where he'd been briefly stationed when he dodged being drafted, murdering and being murdered, which is called elsewhere war, called elsewhere intervention, not what it is, thrown overboard for the insurance by enlisting in the Navy the very day his number was called, which at Sage Council came from his dad, my papa, among the beloved. Joining a meteorology team called the Hundred Knotters for the number of typhoons over the Philippine Sea into the eyes of which they flew, which flight aided and abetted the murder. And flying like this tried sadly to prove himself a citizen, not cargo, loot, thrown overboard for the insurance for anything they can. I glimpsed my mother beneath the umbrella on the towel with our flip-flops and t-shirts, her elbow on the red and white igloo stocked with hard salami sandwiches and juicy juice and plums, watching, not smiling, her right hand making and unmaking fists in the sand. Around his neck, we'd wrap our arms, my brother and me and become in the surf rising to meet us like scrawny brown wings on our dad's back, gusting in the tumult he would drag through until the hands of the water held us up. And he said, big breath. And clinging to his slick manatee shoulders, we plunged airborne, the invisible chrysalis cloaking our little bodies bursting as he reached through the water pulling us with him, reaching toward him to keep from sailing off. How many million eyes in the wake, flashing their light at us, clinging to one another, lit by their looking. And how my face to my dad's shoulder, my shoulder to my brother's face was a kind of breathing and soaring. As a child, I could breathe underwater my father pulling us through the thick air, pulling us through the pulling us by reaching his arms as far forward as he could and dragging them back toward us to keep us from falling, to keep from falling. Like that, he'd be holding us. And in this way, flew some from the overboard and likewise showed us how to fly some from the overboard by reaching toward what you love, which is not a citizenship we are talking about, but a practice. Thank you. And Leah, I'll pass it over to you. Thank you, Ross. Um, I don't know how many times I've read your book. I mean, all of them, but this one beholding um it's so it's so beautiful to hear to hear you read it and um for those of you who haven't read it like that part he just read every line of that means everything <laughs> it's like a fractal poem it's like if you dive into any one part of it you see the whole thing repeated um thanks and thanks for being with with me here tonight um Thank you, Molly and Bam and Morgan and Grey Wolf for making it all real. Um, yeah, and, and thanks, thanks to Ross, um, who I really think of as being sort of at the vanguard of, of this movement that's, um, that's not only willing to look at difficult and sometimes uh, intolerable things, but, um, but also wanting to look at how we're looking at it and um, and at whether we are beholding one another in a way that uh, that gives us a world to move toward and not just against. So 
Um, thanks. Thanks. And, um, and thank you to the Monacan land that I'm coming from today here in Virginia. Um, and uh, yeah, and to my, to my wood stove behind me, which is keeping me warm. I'm going to read a couple of poems for you all from my book, uh, The More Extravagant Feast. Um, I'm going to read a couple from the beginning of the book first. Venison. The deer is still alive in the roadside grass. In an hour, we'll cut her open, her left hip broken, the bone in her dark body. Now the white Camaro shocked in the night and the boy wet faced in the back seat, his parents at a loss by the hood, too young to have meant any of it, the giving or the taking. They are glad for our headlights, glad for our rifle. Her head still on, she hangs outside our kitchen window for the blood to drip, skin pulled down like a shirt. I watch my husband undress her with a knife. I wash the blue plates. When I turn the water off, I can hear his blade unmoor muscle sail through her fascia. We put her leg and buttock on the wooden table where we will gather her between us to eat all year. It is all I see, a thing alive, slowly becoming my own body. Field Guide to the Chaparral. The fire beetle only mates when the chaparral is burning and the water beetle will only mate in the rain. In the monastery kitchen, the nuns don't believe me when I tell them how old I am, that you were married before. The woman you find attractive does not believe me when I look at her kindly. There are candescent people in the world. It will only be love that I love you with. When we get home, there will be our kitchen, the dishes undone, there will be our bedroom. What is it you eventually recognized in my face that allowed you to believe me? Beauty that did not come from you. Remember how it did not come from you? As white sage does not come from the moon, but is found by it and lit. The Buddhists say that the front of the paper cannot exist without the back. Because there is a there, there is a here, chaparral, the density of growth, and the tattered chaps the mappers wore through it because they had to, to keep walking without being hurt. It is okay if we hurt one another. Chaparral needs fire. The pine cones cannot open otherwise. Love needs lover whose last lover was flood. Um, the book, the book then uh, follows two pregnancies sort of in and out of time and in and out of individual bodies um, through the trophic exchanges of energy between land and vegetables and animals and humans and past humans and emergent humans and um, and nearly at the center of all that and nearly at the center of the physical book, there's um, a birth or a, a human child is born. Um, and the, the unknowable moment of, of actual arrival, like the actual moment being unknowable is the, is the subject of a lot of the poems in the book and of the one I'm gonna read next. Um, and I also wanna say that many of the poems in the book are named for their week of pregnancy. It's a, a book about gestation um, but not just about pregnancy. It's a book about gestation. Um, so the ways in which bodies um, of all species, of all things, uh, always um, are always forming into other bodies in, in the womb of the world. If I can say a thing like that, but I'm a poet, right? So I can say a thing like that. Okay. Um, so this one is called Week 10 Plum. One, my body, which has never died, has two hearts again today, and how many inside the second? 
This body, which has been planted in ears and kidneys, fingers and formed lungs, a person almost the size of a plum, unbecome, her own seed already in her. This body, which is two bodies and a thousand more in either direction of time, the wake of the present has died 10,000 times, planted as it is in the mud where the plum must grow, planted as it is in the dew. Two, the moon may never have been a plum. Look at her. Having dropped the dark robe of her skin, you would not know it. Three, I tell the colored dove I am sown, a body inside a body for the rain to soak. I carry her father and his mother and hers. The field adores the seed, affords the farmer who frets a task. Every flower faces away. I'm looking for what they watch. The path through the field leads to nothing but the field. The dove calls three syllables all morning, compassion, my daughter, all the night. Four, my own cells planted by my father and my mother who breathed for me for some time. The sun was their bodies before it was mine, was the bread and the fish their parents ate and the steel and the ash. Who took the bread and the fish? I can't remember any of it. If joy is watching a person bear a pitcher of water across the field where you are working, if happiness is drinking it, then I will watch the leaves who watch the sun go without flinching while my own heart opens and closes the shutters of my ribs every time. Um, I suppose I should read also, um, I'll read for you all the title poem. The More Extravagant Feast. The buck is thawing a halo on the frosted ground, shot in our field pre-dawn. Last night, we pulled a float in the Christmas parade. It was lit by a thousand tiny lights. My daughter rode in my lap and was thrilled when the float followed us. Ours is a small town. Everyone was there and their faces not seeing ours fixed behind us were an open sea, a compound sea of seas that parted under our gaze and Santa was bright, though my daughter shied from the noise of him. She studied the red and white fur of his suit. She woke this morning when the rifle fired outside. I lifted her to see the sunrise and her father kneeling above the buck's body in the middle distance. She asked if they would be cold. I brought him gloves and warm water, knelt with him in the spare light by the buck who steamed, whose liver and heart kept so long dark, spilled onto the winter grass, whose open eyes saw none of it, realized nothing of my husband's knife, slicing open his abdomen, his rectum. The puncture of his diaphragm startled, startled me more than the gunshot opening a cavern of blood that poured over his white belly. I did not understand the offering, but loved it. The fur, red, white, incoherent, somehow cleaner. When I come back in, she asks me to draw a picture of her father on the hill. I pick her up, the miracle of her lungs that grew inside me, kept long dark, her working heart let out into the rounder world, the more extravagant feast, the miracle of her dad on the hill as we draw him, in his big coat, warm. Afterward, how he and I hold each other differently, feeling the collections of muscles and organs held somehow together. The miracle of bodies formed whole, like fruits, skins unruptured and containing the world. Um, and if I have time, do I have time to read? A little? Okay, <laughs> Ross, who's not in charge, says yes. Um, I'm gonna read a, an excerpt from uh, from an essay too, because I thought I thought that um, this would help us with our with our theme tonight, with our our anchor. 
um, and connect to Ross's work. So this is this is an excerpt from an essay that uh, was published last April in, in the Paris Review. Um, and uh, yeah, and it was April 2020. So just to remind y'all what <laughs> that came after March 2020, um, just to situate you in time. Uh, the essay is called Return, Investment, Return. And we're jumping in in the middle of it. My life decisions, like those of many, are attempts at joy. Some of the choices my partner and I have been able to make are motivated by the desire to disentangle ourselves from systems whose interconnections rely on hidden suffering. But my hope, and I think the greater truth, is that our decisions are also motivated toward interconnection, toward joy. Each of us who pooled our tears at the funeral last week is now in an isolated cell. Each of us in the United States is now in a cell and countless of us the world over. Prisoners live in cells, but so do monastics. So does all biological life, isolated and interconnected into the, into the formation of organisms, apple, deer, human being. Cells are discrete, but they are not separate. There is the larger body. The physical world escalates its refrain. Nothing is abstract neither virus nor spiritual truth. The garden and the woods have been for me a kind of proof of what Thich Nhat Hanh would call interbeing. I believed in interbeing before I depended directly on a garden, but in the garden, the visible proof is delightful. The seed contains the melon, the melon contains the seed. My life is made quite physically of the melon and the apple and the deer that I eat of the life of the garden and woods. Without them, I have no body. Without my body, my children have no bodies, no gestation, no milk, nothing to eat. This is true everywhere. The garden and the woods make the lesson slow enough, clear enough for me to grasp. Likewise, pregnancy and nursing clarify patiently that my partner, children, land, and I comprise one another. The slow gestation and weaning of a child a body inside a body, a body in need of a body, make real the questions, where is it that I end and the child begins? Where do I begin and you? We are interconnected. Right now, we are interconnected by a virus, infinite filaments between us made apparent, connections which are tethers, which are lifelines. Because I'm not abstract, my cell walls are vulnerable, semi-permeable, they are able to give and receive. I love poetry because it translates the abstract to the concrete, the universal to the specific, and then translates it all back again. Poetry locates a specific person in a body connected necessarily to all bodies in all places. It's a signal between cells that connects the larger body, enables it to feel. The four of us made it home from the funeral to our place to shelter in. We are here now, planting, working, and watching the garden and the woods which do not shut down, which still bear investment and return, just as humans do in one another. It's from here I send this bottle to the waves. If there is a message in it, it's that from here I see systems that still function. I can see them, the seed, the soil, the streams and springs, the lives of animals and plants that have evolved in response to one another's needs. They are the systems we're all depending on from our disparate cells to provide the still unbelievable miracle that is food, the met need that is water. These systems are everywhere, no matter how visible. They are larger and deeper than any of the ones we are watching fall apart and we're integral to them semi-permeable, vulnerable, able to give and receive. Our relationship to these systems, like any relationship that endures, is both responsibility and gift. They are still carrying us. We can still let them. Um, so, um, that, is, that is what I have. And I think now Ross and I get to talk to each other. We do, yeah. Beautiful. Great. Yeah. Um, your book's so beautiful. 
it's so, it's so so lovely and that that there's so many moments of it that that I'm just like god the the sort of study and entanglement um or interdependence uh, or I can't remember you put it in even another way in that in that one um but it's just so moving to me and can I ask you a question <laughs> <laughs> Only if I can ask you like 10, but yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah, we can do that. <laughs> and I guess in a way I'm sort of like, I mean, so your book is such an amazing sort of like study exactly the way you sort of described it is what I like the sort of ways that we are mutually constitutive beyond what we even imagine ourselves to be. And it's, and it, and it you know, deals with, you know, the, in, it goes from the sort of the home or a certain kind of space, but into the land and into the, um, all of the creatures. And in a way I'm sort of like, one of my questions is like, is that a study that you get from being in the garden hmm. or with the land? And I'm sort of like, where's the, I guess in a way I'm like, where's that, where's that study or practice come from? You yeah, know? where's anything come from? Where's yeah. anything begin? Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, thank you so much. Um, I mean, I will say that, um, I, all of, I think maybe the word I used that you were interested in, Ross, might have been interbeing, um, okay. which is a fabulous word that I did not make up. Um, it's, it's a word of Thich Nhat Hans, actually. Uh, yeah. Um, and, uh, I believed in it. Like, I believed, I believed in it, you know, and I, I believed in a lot of sort of abstract, uh, they didn't seem abstract at the time, but I, a lot of ideas of um, interconnection and interdependence and um, yeah, yeah. Uh, but then to, to use one of your words, which which you didn't make up, <laughs> it got it got mycelial, right? Like um, yeah, yeah, like those mangroves. Um, yeah, yeah. And so yeah, I think when I started depending on a garden. Um, and you know, even more so when I went with when I became pregnant with my first daughter, um, it was just it just stopped being abstract. It just ceased to be an idea. It was just like, oh, like my body. What is my body other than all these other bodies, right? Other than other than her body, um, but also my partner's body, but also all of his ancestors and my ancestors. And and then in that way, I was like, I am I am no different from the butternut squash <laughs> right um who has yeah those seeds in her and the seeds have more butternuts and the butternuts have more seeds and yeah. um yeah i mean so i don't know where it started I, I i do think it's in those places that it became really concrete i don't think it i, I know it doesn't exist only in those places um i know it exists uh in brooklyn and everywhere yeah. Um, but I'm grateful, yeah, to have that, that's, uh, to have that slowed study. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's such a, um, I mean, it feels, one of the things that I love about being, you know, able to garden <clears throat> and being with a, gutty, uh, with a garden and deep in a garden is that thing, which is not, like, I didn't grow up gardening, you know, and I didn't, um, but that some sort of like when you're, you know, in the process of sort of witnessing um, how many things depend on how many things. Mm -hmm. And then the depending becomes this other word, which is like they are each other. Mm -hmm. And then the we are each mm -hmm. other, that kind of like thing that you were talking about. And then, then you're sort of like, oh, right. Not only am I like a butternut squash, I am a butternut squash. <laughs> yes. It's yeah, kind of, totally. You know, there's, yeah, something. Yeah. Really and funny. it's not a metaphor. Like it's not, that's what blows me away over and over again is that it's not a metaphor. It's just like a physical yeah. reality. It's a physical truth that like, there is no my body without these other things. Right, right, yeah. right. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I'm so thrilled that you read the excerpt that you read, although you could have read any excerpt from your poem, but um, yeah, I think, I think, 
I think I had, I, <laughs> I think I was unable to put your book down for a really long time. And, and I had, I had all the pieces of it when the first time I was reading it through, I had all the pieces of it, like, you know, doing their, their ballet. And then, um, and then it all really came together for me with that, with that line, the reaching, that reaching is a way of not falling. Um, I kept, you know, I could, I didn't quite know why we were talking about reaching. I mean, I didn't, I, I'll hear you talk about anything, but like, that's when it all, that's when it all happened for me was when, um, with that line that the reaching is a way of not falling, um, that that was the difference between flying and falling is reaching. Right. Yeah. And uh, for those of you who have not read Ross's book, read it. Um, but it's, it's, it's ostensibly, yeah, right. About Dr. J um, doing a, a layup in the 1980 NBA playoffs. Um, and uh, it does start about that. That's true. Um, <laughs> but it, uh, yeah. And he's doing this move and he's, and he's flying. Right. Um, and that's the incredible thing. And he's, um, he's not falling because he's reaching. And so it's this, it's this reaching that we see your dad do in the, in the part you read us. Um, and then, yeah, and it's that reaching towards one another that I feel like, I feel like in that poem, you just keep answering questions like you, but then there's questions inside the answers, not mm -hmm. unlike the butternut. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and so, so I don't know. So I feel like um, that's what I wanna do tonight is just sort of reach. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. We all yeah. reach towards you, um, and and you all at home reach, um, and 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 we'll behold it. We'll be held by it, and um, we'll see what we talk about. But but yeah, you know that when you mentioned that, I was sort of remembering how um, it's like a poetry thing. I'm going to realize is that the the process of writing that poem. So yeah, so, you know, the, the poem is like a ostensibly a hundred page poem that sort of like has its primary like focus on this move from the 1980 NBA playoffs, like you said, the finals between the Sixers, the Philadelphia 76ers and the LA Lakers. And Dr. J makes the best move ever in the history of basketball, um, the NBA. And, um, but I was watching that move so closely, this basketball move, you know, I just was studying it. And in the process of studying that move, I, you know, looking and looking and looking, I was at some point, I was like, um, and, I'm, and I'm looking because I'm thinking about looking and I'm thinking about witness and I'm thinking about study and I'm thinking about the imagination and I'm thinking about flight and I'm thinking about fugitivity and, 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 and I'm thinking about basketball. Um, and I, I noticed at some point coming back to that image like, like just studying or trying to describe as closely as I possibly can what he's, <laughs> mm -hmm. what he's doing. It was at some point that I, I was like, man, it's, he's, he's coming down now. He's actually coming down now, you know? Like he jumps and he has to, he jumps so high that he has to duck his head to like get under the backboard. And he's, you know, and Kareem's there. So he has to reach and, and Jamal Wilkes is up top. and. But at some point I realized, oh, he's still making the move, which is to say now, I mean, it's occurring to me, he's still flying mm -hmm. while falling, like you said, because of the reaching that he's doing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's like um, the, the poem is really trying to figure out again, among other things, like how, how it is that we do reach toward one another as a way um, in the midst of, um, as a way to continue moving toward each other. How do, we re how do we reach toward each other despite? Yeah, despite being thrown overboard for the, for the yeah. insurance, yeah. 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 Um, yeah, and what, what I, what blows my mind about this poem, and literally, y'all, like, at home, <laughs> this, this is something I've never seen done in poetry before, um, is that, that um, Ross, like, lets us do that with him in really real ways. So I'll just talk to you, Ross. Um, uh, thank you for letting us do that with you. And, and like, um, I don't know, it's... Uh, <laughs> In, in, in nature writing, 
which has, which is not probably what we're doing, but like in nature writing, which has this history of like mansplaining, right? This long history of um, some usually white man saying, um, saying, hey, I'm looking at, I, I'm, I'm on an adventure. <laughs> I'm looking at something. And just because I'm looking at it, therefore it's important and you should be looking at it too. Or, or let me tell you about it because, because the assumption is I'm important. Like you're doing this totally other subversive thing of, um, of, of actually letting the reader look with you. And in part, because the images are in the book, like this book is full of, of images of photographs. Um, and so it was so pleasurable. To, I mean, if nothing else, just pleasurable to be like reading your descriptions of the images, but have access to the images so that like my body was literally performing what your body was performing when you wrote it. Um, and, and it really felt like we are here together. Like we, <laughs> and then, and then that, that there are these parts throughout his, throughout your poem, Ross, where you like tell us to remember to breathe, which you have to tell us to remember to do because you're talking about stuff that will make you stop breathing, right? And and so um, to have you literally tell us like that we have to breathe. Um, and then your refrain of what am I looking at? What am I practicing throughout? Um, it just, it was the first like honest, somehow transcendent, um, attempt at description that I've ever, I want to say read, but it doesn't feel like read. It feels like participated in, you know, it feels like, it feels like, and I'll shut up in a minute, but like, it feels like you're, you're not telling us about flying. You're flying with us mm. is what it feels like, you mm. know? Um, yeah. And, 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 and that even beyond that, you're looking deeply at the conditions that require flight and or enable flight and like mm -hmm. that's the crucial difference like <laughs> are we requiring flight or or enabling flight um yeah, yeah i don't know thank you thank you for like i feel like that i mean if if tonight's theme is healing like that was so healing to not be told mm. about some mm. adventure but to like be flying with you mm. thank you yeah that when you were saying about the I can't remember exactly how you said it, but the feeling of like, we're sort of doing this together. I remember at some point I, in the, in the, in the poem, I sort of described the thing of, I'm, I'm just gonna sort of wonder with your questions. Um, yeah, yeah. And maybe then offer a question. I wanna ask you some the, the um, I realized when I was watching, you know, so I'm talking about the witnessing of, of brutality and I'm, and I'm talking about the witnessing of, you know, um, racist violence, you know, and, um, and I'm talking about the ways that our imaginations are um, brutalized, in fact, by the sort of witnessing. And so there's, there's a reframe, there's a refrain um, that is, what am I looking at? What, what am I doing? What am I practicing? What am I looking at? And at some point I realized, and this is a question, this is a, a sort of a question that the poem, the poem I don't think answers, but I think the poem sort of raises and, tries to struggle with is that um, as I'm watching Dr. J move, I'm watching his body do this mm -hmm. thing, you know, um, again and again, I'm watching, I'm watching his body do this thing. And at some point I realized without, I realized that my body was doing this thing mm -hmm. that I was watching, you know, this impossibly beautiful thing that I was watching. Um, which to me just feels significant as a sort of, um, of a, as a, um, as a question about looking, it's mm -hmm. significant. But what also feels um, like lovely to hear you talk about is like the, the, I, you know, just the idea that, like, I'm talking about my body being, <laughs> like, it's just, you know, like, I, you know, when you talk about your poems different times, like, different things sort of come to your mind. And, like, the, the mm -hmm. idea of, like, something that I'm witnessing is making, is, is making my body do something. And the way that you were talking um, is, is sort of moving to me because I'm like, oh, right, right. 
part of the part of the question or something of this poem is that now our bodies are doing something mm -hmm. to get like we're sort of you know there's some kind of there and and just to say that in terms of the question there's some indication of our you know whatever the word is you know our sort of overlap or our or our kind of you know whether it's like a deep kind of tie which it is whether or not we want to you know right uh, yeah or whether it's just like a oh yeah you know and there's something about that you know the when that when that um the metaphor of the mycelium mm -hmm. which is to me um first of all no metaphor <laughs> as i say it i'm like no metaphor. and secondly it's like one of the one of these models of like oh oh that's mm -hmm. how that's how you know mm -hmm. and the mangroves you know sort of holding holding each other um i think of you know the 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 practice of entanglement and yeah yeah, the, the practice of being entangled with each other, which is, it's a, it's a practice against, a, against so many things, mm -hmm. you know, and the and so many things, including the sort of training that we're discrete individuals that mm -hmm. somehow can escape from our entanglement mm -hmm. to one another, as though that you know a thing called freedom might be the sort of dream of being unentangled from one another or the choice. Mm -hmm. um, the choice of entanglement, um, which to me is sort of like it raises the question of like, right, so you have to practice a kind of, you have to practice entanglement, like in a mm -hmm. capitalist or supremacist patriarchal. Yeah, you know, like let's do entanglement well. Like, we to, yeah, we have yeah. to be like, okay, like, yeah. And 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 so I, I just want to, there's that line that you have that I am just like, you know, and you're you're talking about joy because in a some way I feel like <laughs> the my question or one of my questions is the way and and this poem does sort of a, arrive at the question but my question is like what are the overlaps of entanglement um interdependence mm -hmm. and joy and you say if joy is watching a person bear a pitcher of water across the field where you are working if happiness is drinking it then I will watch the leaves who watch the sun go without flinching while my own heart opens and closes the shutters of my ribs every time. And I was just like, I mean, I, you know, I just like, <laughs> I loved it because it felt like a moment in a poem where you were theorizing joy, you know, mm. which to me is like good work. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you want to respond to that or, or, or if we should, I mean, I so I want to respond to that. Can I, Morgan? Yeah, right. yeah. I'm just, yeah. I just want to open up really quickly. If you're tuning in, please feel free to drop a question in the chat and I'll let Leah respond to Ross and then we'll take a few questions. And I, I'm just going to sit here and smile while you guys respond. I've been enjoying this <laughs> immensely. Thanks. Yeah. Oh, man. Um, yeah, I mean, first I'm thinking about like your line, Ross, that's... Uh, so powerful that um, nothing happens only when it happens. Mm -hmm. um, and I, and I, I guess what I wanna say we're saying <laughs> is like also nothing happens only to whom it happens. Mm -hmm. Like, um, and that, that even in, in beholding one another, we um, become one another in that way. But yeah, you asked about joy. Um, I actually really like, I like, I like your definition of joy better mm -hmm. <laughs> than mine, um, <laughs> which um, I think I'm pulling this from one of your essays in, in the Book of Delights, um, where you talk about joy being, being, I think you're quoting your student, but the joining of two wildernesses, right? Um, yeah, and, and uh, I don't know, like if we're gonna talk about freedom from entanglement, I feel like that's a pretty good definition of, um, because I guess in that in that essay, um, you're talking about the wilderness being the sorrow, right? Like, so if we if we join our sorrows, is that joy? Is your question that you ask really clearly in that essay? And um, um, 
yeah, like maybe that's how we do entanglement well is like not run away from our sorrows, <laughs> not run away from each other's sorrows. Um, yeah, like like behold them, right? I'm just using your language at you, but. <laughs> well, your language, the thing I was sort of like, if Joy is watching a person bear a pitcher of water across the field uh, where you're working and happiness is drinking it. I love, I, you know, you know, I'm just like, Right, there's just this little argument happening, this beautiful mm -hmm. argument. Like joy is the sort of, joy is the, is watching, watching the, the care is watching, is sort of, you know, and I'm not, you know, I'm not like trying mm -hmm. to like nail anything down, but it is sort of like this beautiful thing of like, if joy is this and happiness is, is drinking it, but joy is like the sort of witnessing of, mm -hmm. maybe it's the reaching towards, like joy is the reaching towards. It's witnessing the reaching or something. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And this is, this is what I love about your book, Come to Life. Like where, what does it mean? It means co-creation. Like we're, we're in the meaning making together. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I just wanted to jump in because we just yeah. got a really great question that speaks to all of this a bit um, from Alex. So thank you, Alex, for your question. Um, it says, more extravagant <laughs> feast is also about witnessing a kind of violence different from the kind of violence Ross is thinking about. Um, is there something healing and witnessing? Is it a kind of practice of entanglement? Um, so that's, that's to me, that question. I think it's a bit to both of you. And would it be helpful if I read the last part again? Sure. Yeah. Great. Um, it's, it, the question more broadly is, is there something healing in the witnessing of the different kinds of violence that you guys are witnessing. Um, and is that a kind of practice in entanglement? And Leah, if you wanna start off with your response and then Ross. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I don't know what violence is. Um, I feel like there's a lot of, of violence uh, as Ross explores in just how we look at one another. Um, I'm not totally convinced and I, I'm assuming that Alex means the, the violence towards the deer in, in the poems that I read. Um, I could be wrong in that assumption, but um, yeah, that doesn't feel violent to me. Um, it feels like uh, intense, <laughs> um, but the way that, that we do that um, feels really sacred and holy actually. Um, yet uh, that doesn't to me occur, it doesn't occur to me as a violent act. It does, it is the witnessing of the ending of a life, um, but it's also um, what makes it clear that that there's no such thing as the ending of a life, like the fact that this body, um, that the, all the energy contained in that body uh, is not lost, that nothing collapses, right? Yeah. Yeah, Ross? Yeah, I mean, in the, um, the, the witnessing that I'm talking about in, in my poem mm -hmm. um, or the witnessings, I think there, there are modes of witness that are, um, that are, um, that have the capacity for renovation. And we know that, you know, and help and healing. Um, and that, I think that, that feels, that's a very important point or question to, to make and, um, Alex, thank you for that question or point. And one of the one of the questions of this book, or maybe one of the questions of this book is, what are the modes of witness that are in fact the the healing modes of witness? Or or and healing may not be the right word, um, but what are there are certain kinds of witness modes of witness, and witness may not be exactly the right word either. Sometimes it is, sometimes it's not. I think, mm -hmm. but then there are modes of witness that require the violence so that those modes of witness can carry on, I, you know, or, or I wonder that, I wonder that question, which is to say, I wonder if there are ways of looking that not only require, but replicate the violence that is being seen. I, I mean, I, I suspect there is, and I, you know, I kind of feel like I know there is. And so in a way, like my question in, in, in this book, Beholding is, how, and I, and I don't at all, and I don't at all um, 
uh, pretend that I know the difference. Um, and I also don't at all pretend that I know that that a, a kind of looking at one point isn't one thing and then it isn't another thing at another point. Um, but that question feels so, um, so, so profoundly important um, to me that, that we attend to the ways that we look so that we do not make more brutality you know, that we practice that, you know, as hard as we can, you know. Yeah, thank you, Ross. And I think your collection models that really well and kind of pulls at it and keeps that question going. Um, I wanted to Morgan, offer- I, another. Morgan, if I can offer like one more little little response to that. Um, yeah, if, 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 um, if consuming is inherently violent, which I don't know if it is, but if it is, um, yeah, I, I would say that there is a witnessing in in my book of that violence as opposed to um, the not witnessing of um, if we were to eat meat uh, that that uh, came from elsewhere, right? Which which we don't. <laughs> um, but if we if we did, um, or even eat like tofu or beans that came from from elsewhere, there's a lot of violence in industrial agriculture that that um, I would yeah I would much rather witness. The killing of the deer. Thanks, Leah. Mm -hmm. um, and I just wanted to offer another question um, from Amon. Thank you, Amon. Um, how do joy and the act of forming identity collide for the both of you in your writing, the garden, and elsewhere? And uh, we can start with Ross this time. Say it again. That's a great question. Okay. How do joy and the act of forming identity collide for the both of you? in your writing, the garden, and elsewhere? Great question. <laughs> That's a hard question. Joy and the act of forming identity. So, I mean, like, you know, um, you, know you know, I'll try. <laughs> but one thing that I think right away is that, that I do try to sort of, I mean, I think of joy, like Leah said, like, you know, you know, sort of in a in a perpetual sort of state of revision and 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 wandering and curiosity. I do think of joy as like a kind of this emotion or this state, maybe, or this sort of residence. I'll say uh, where where the mutual holding of sorrow um, itself constitutes this other thing, and maybe the resonance where we can hold each other's sorrow is this place called joy. And maybe the place called joy gets sort of like made habitable because we're willing to hold each other's sorrow, you know? Um, which frankly, Leah, I feel like the, your engagement with the processes of the earth in that poem is that kind of being with the sorrow, you know, that we come from each other, you know, or that some, you know, that that, that feels like a kind of, a, that feels like a kind of uh, joy to me, actually. Which, which is made also of sorrow. Um, and the poem holds that sorrow, you know, the poem, you know, the poem holds that sorrow. But, but so if there is that, in terms of forming an identity, if there is that sense, which is like a hard sense to maintain because it's a little bit, um, abstracts the wrong word, but it's a little bit like, challenging it's also like a little bit challenging when you're someone who just like is sometimes just afraid of fear or sometimes you're just afraid of sorrow or you're sometimes you're like me and you actually have to learn to not run from your sorrow or not convert it into anxiety or paranoia or anger you know but to sort of just like um sit in a kind of residence of sorrow with someone else or with everything <laughs> and to sort of then from that sort of imagine or be building a place where joy can be can be possible if that's the case i feel like one's identity um is you know even the idea of one's identity starts to like change you know like um 
and, and I don't know how to say this because the question is so good that I don't fucking know how to say it. <laughs> I mean, I have plenty that I don't know how to say, but like the question is really good because in part it makes me feel like the, in terms of identity, like, and it, it goes back a little bit to our conversation too, is that the being with suggests that like one's identity is constantly being sort of, mm -hmm. you know, worked out. It's constantly being worked out, you know, and we, you know, we can kind of, you know, intellectually understand that, you know, that we're always in, in sort of formation with and around and against others. But that question makes me think it in a different kind of way that, that I only want to offer as I, that's what I want to offer, you know, like beautiful question. Mm -hmm. and, uh, it makes me think it in a different kind of way. Yeah. 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 Um, I mean, I feel like, yeah, I mean, I love, I just want to honor first, like that, that idea of constant, <laughs> we all started doing this when you started doing this, which is the whole, the whole thing you're saying. Um, but that, that dismantling and remantling, right? Like, which the more than human world is doing all the time, like the trees are doing that all the time, um, like the rose bush or whatever, like this constant dismantling and remantling. Um, and uh, I feel like, I don't know, an attempt to answer that, that great question is um, there's, I feel like one way that I come at that, and, and maybe this is what Ross does too, um, yeah, is just sort of slowing it down, like, <laughs> um, and now, of course, this is what Ross did with his clip of Dr. J, right? Like slow it down for 90 pages. And, um, and I think that's, that's the thing. Like, I think, <laughs> I don't think you have to watch Dr. J to do that. I don't think you have to be in a garden to do that. Um, or in the woods, even like, like anything, anything. Like it's that kind of attention. It's that, that continual looking, like looking past the looking. <laughs> um, yeah, I feel like that's maybe a, a place where um, Ross's work and mine intersect. Um, yeah, and I, I feel like writing is that in a lot of ways. Like that's what the that's what the page is. It's this like, yeah, like you don't have to look away. <laughs> like you can just keep looking at that page um, and 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 bowing down to whatever you need to bow down to until it teaches you something. Mm -hmm. Wow, thank you guys so much for your generosity in answering these questions. And I just wanna be mindful of the time. So I think that's our last one. Um, and I'm gonna invite Molly back on to close us out and just a huge thank you again. Um, thank you so much, Ross. Thank you so much, Leah, for your beautiful words and readings and reflections and conversation. Um, thank you, Morgan, for all that you did to make tonight happen. Um, and thank you to all of you for tuning in and being with us this evening. Um, as a reminder, buy their books because they're beautiful and you absolutely will not regret it. And if you've already bought them, buy them for friends because, you know, your friends will like you more. Um, <laughs> but in any case, uh, thank you again for tuning in and have a good night.